If someone approached you on the street and mentioned the name Langrisser, you'd be forgiven for thinking it's some budget energy drink from Bavaria. However, it's not inaccurate to say that the series at one point was a key player in the SRPG scene, with many considering its predecessor, the Elfly Trilogy, as a pioneer for the genre. With the original trilogy created back in 1987 for the NEC PC, Langrisser acted as a successor both in terms of gameplay and linearity, drawing on events that defined the narrative of the previous titles and going on to spawn five games of its own. With its first and only English release under the name Warsong back in 1991 for the Sega Mega Drive, the series has since faded into relative obscurity, though fan translations are available for some of the other titles. However, in 2019, both Langrisers 1 and 2 received a much welcome remaster due to Chara Ani, and this was later published by NIS America for Western audiences. Now available on the likes of Switch, PlayStation 4 and PC, the games are now getting some long overdue exposure to wider masses. As for myself, I have been playing the PC version of these games, which ran very well in that there were no hard crashes and I was playing with my trusty 360 controller which had no noticeable issues during play sessions. As of the time of recording, I have indeed finished both titles. There will also be minor spoilers for each game here, but anything that is plot intensive will mostly be limited to the first hour or so with the likelihood that Langris's 1 and 2 will be the first introduction that many will have into the series, let's see if we can answer the question, are they any good though? Now before you delve into the game proper, a quick visit to the options gives the player a choice as to whether they wish to play with the remastered graphics or the classic sprites and maps. You can even have an amalgamation of the two, should you desire, and while I do think the classic sprites look amazing drawing on that 80s and early 90s exaggerated attire, I mean look at that circlet, you could kill a man with that. I was more a fan of the remastered art. It's also worth noting that choosing the classic sprites will not allow you to see the new CG artwork in cutscenes. That being said, I am happy that the choice is there for those wanting a bit of nostalgia from the originals. This treatment also translates to the soundtrack, of which I again opted for the remastered tunes. Can I just say as well how awesome this opening song is? It really gets you pumped for some action. Now I use the word action very literally here, because that is where most of your time is going to be spent. I'm not even kidding, we're talking 90% gameplay here, so of that you would think said gameplay is pretty awesome, right? Hell yeah it is, I nearly had you there didn't I? As a pure SRPG experience, both games do a very good job. Naturally I started with Langrisser 1, I mean of course we're gonna go chronologically, I'm not some uncultured swine, and immediately you are thrust into the mosh pit of battle after a small character creation event. For anyone who has ever played an SRPG, the Langrisser games are going to be relatively easy to get the hang of. You have your main characters, noted as commanders, who can move around the overmap freely and engage in combat. However, Langrisser separates itself from the crowd by utilising recruitable units known as mercenaries who fall under the jurisdiction of a chosen commander. Each commander can enlist a number of mercenaries, though there doesn't appear to be a way to mix different types of units into one squad, but this provides an additional layer to the tactical side of the gameplay. In typical fashion, there is a weapons triangle a la Fire Emblem, but instead of spear, sword and axe, you have sword beat spear, spear beat cavalry, and cavalry beat infantry. On top of this, there are special units available such as marines, ghosts, priests, demons, and flying units who also have unique advantages in battle. In most cases, you're also able to rearrange the position of your commanders to certain spots. This means you can survey the land before the battle starts and capitalise on your commander's strengths to claim victory. For example, if you have a commander blocked by a mountain, you can exchange their position with a flying commander to avoid the issue, which may also give a flanking opportunity. These layers of tactics also extend to the combat itself. When a unit engages another, a small in-game battle will play out, which will likely be hit and miss for many people, as will these in-game models, but they can be turned off via the menu. The, the, the fight sequences, I mean, not the models. The most probable outcome of the fight is shown beforehand, so you can decide which battles you want to partake in. 
and a sense of realism is added in that the weaker your unit becomes, the less damage they will do in subsequent fights, so you may need to decide if it's worth healing with one of your precious commanders for the potential of dealing more damage. Movements of your units will also need to be considered in lieu of the enemy's potential to counterattack, which can be seen by a simple press of the X button. Positioning also has greater significance when you have to consider terrain advantages, obstructions and casting spells, as casters cannot move and use a spell in the same turn. That being said, I will admit that the AI's a bit… naff. They seem to prioritise attacking units for the most part and opt out of attacking commanders, even when it's pretty clear that they'll kill them should they go all out. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean kill, I meant incapacitate, because your commanders don't bite the dust in this game outside of story events, so that kind of takes away some of the in-game pressure, and unfortunately there doesn't appear to be a way to change it. I will also say that the game feels quite easy, with no way to amend the difficulty outside of clearing the game and launching the challenge mode, which is kind of like a new game plus. Despite this though, it's still enjoyable. As for experience, all of the points are channeled into the commander, meaning if a unit from their squad bests an enemy, those experience points will pass to them as default. I mean, what is this, some sort of battle tax? Oh, you could fight with me, but you've got to give me experience in exchange, bucko. With said experience, you will naturally level up, but you can also gain class points which can be used to advance your commander even more. And there is a lot of choice here. Each path provides various benefits and traits that can be applied and it gives a degree of flexibility as to how you want to build your army, not to mention giving you more mercenary options. Outside of levelling up, the rest of your downtime will be spent buying new items at the shop and keeping your equipment up to snuff. And I want to say it, this menu sucks. It's weird, as you pick an item, it compares one parameter of every commander in your party, normally the one which is most affected by the equipment change. So in other words, you need to keep flicking from stat to stat to decide if it will be a good buy for you or not. Not to mention you can't even equip them in the shop window, you have to come all the way out, back to your commander menu and do it that way. And when you've got so many commanders later on in the game, it's hard to keep track of who you bought what for. A simple change would have made it much better. But like I say, outside of class progression and equipment, your downtime outside of fighting is minimal, and unfortunately this does affect an important part of the game. I will say, Langrisser 1 starts very well. This siege event is brilliant, you know, you're in danger and you need to escape. Okay, you have my attention. With regret though, it peters out quite quickly after this event. You see, narrative is a very important element for me to enjoy a game, and the first Langrisser title doesn't really deliver on that. My first issue lies in the characters. They are basic, like Pokemon starter basic. Their backstories are either not developed or straight up missing in action, which makes it very hard to relate to them. In many cases, they'll spout a few lines and voila, they're fighting with you now. Also, there's a complete lack of group dynamic as they prefer to talk to the main character rather than with each other. I mean, what is this, some sort of weird harem? It's also hard to get emotionally invested into a character when they literally explode on death. Like, I don't know, give me one of those nice CG scenes, this is meant to be an emotional send-off to an old friend. Hey Admiral, how do we make the scene emotional? Blow him up. Ugh. My main issue though lies with the story itself. It's the generic light fights, the darkness, yada yada yada, with a text box explaining the context before the mission, and you'll get a small cutscene to tie up loose ends if you're lucky. However, there are shifting perspectives to said story as you play through. Though a campaign is short, clocking in at 20 chapters from start to finish, Langrisser 1 provides a myriad of routes that you can partake in, which naturally changes the result and ending. I really like this idea, but again, it falls flat. In total, there are 8 routes for Langrissa 1, but in reality, I'd say there are only 3. You could probably argue 4. The others feel more like padding, changing a line of dialogue or something from the epilogue, and that's about it. But at least it's easy to move between story routes. We have a story tree where you can immediately go back to previous missions in order to trigger a new route, and combine this with save files you- wait. What? <laughs> There's only 20 save files? I mean, that's a joke, right? I must be missing something. 
No. There are genuinely 20 save files in a game with multiple routes. I don't care what anyone says, that is criminal for a game like this, especially if, like me, you want to save after every mission. I will say though that the use of the story tree is quite humorous as it carries over your levels and spells. You can save a game right at the end of a route and when you've finished said playthrough, you load it up, go back to the branch and now you've got beast characters facing off against grunts and you can just steamroll through the upcoming routes. I actually really like this mechanic, it's nice to play the game properly but when you just want to see how the story unfolds this is a massive time saver and it's just funny to pelt level 5 bandits with a meteor shower. <laughs> Now when I say I had finished the games, I probably wasn't completely truthful there. I played through five of these routes before I was starting to burn out, simply watching the other three on YouTube, and I'm glad I did. They changed very little in the grand scheme of things. That being said though, I will say that the three main routes, or four depending on what you want to say, actually had clear distinction between each other, and were pretty good. Also, I can't be too harsh on the generic nature of these story arcs as I feel they're more a product of their time than anything else. Overall, I'd say Langrisser 1 was a mediocre experience. That being said though, I will say that it provides the perfect foundation for a sequel that irons out the issues that I had with this game. Well, it's a good thing we have said sequel. No sooner are we back at the main menu are we playing Langrisser 2. Evidently my opinion of the first game was not so favourable, so what can I say about its successor? Well put it this way, I put 18 hours into Langrisser 1. I have put over 30 hours into Langrisser 2. The same gripes I had with the first game are here, the shop menus, toilet, the save files are asinine and the gameplay is the same. Solid, but plagued by exploitable AI. Overall though, I'd say that this game evokes the scale of battles in a more effective way. I mean, look at this, this is metal. I'll also say that the dynamic events that happen during missions are more interesting. They add higher levels of pressure to a situation and sometimes will require some more tactical nouts from the player to circumvent. There's also a lot more options available in the class trees as there are several end classes for certain characters giving more flexibility than its predecessor. Weirdly enough though, this game seems to give a heck of a lot more tutorial exposition at least in comparison to Langrisser 1, which basically had none outside of a pause menu. Okay Scott, thanks mate, let's roast these guys. Uh, okay Scott, I, I get you man. <laughs> Come on, mate. Jokes aside, though, the story, or should I say stories, of Langrisser 2 are just far better. Set a couple hundred years after the events of Langrisser 1, we join Adol Kristin. Sorry, that's not it. Ah, here we go. Rewind! We join Elwyn and his traveller companion Hain on their various branching journeys throughout the land. Now you've got a similar structure for the stories here, but there are several reasons why I feel Langrisser 2 is just so much more enjoyable to play through. Let's start with the characters, I would say they are head and shoulders above the cast from Langrisser 1. The rival character is done justice, you've got some comedy relief in there, the characters actually interact with each other rather than just the main character, and the backstories of said individuals, while simple, are at least disclosed to you. And it's not just the good guys who are great here. The villains are brilliant in this game. I put villains in quotation marks here because, well, they definitely don't feel like it. They're threatening indeed, but they also have morals, goals, and codes of honour that they stick by. They feel more human, and it becomes more akin to a clash of ideals rather than a clash of good and evil. That being said, there are indeed evil characters in this game, but a lot of the enemies you face force you to consider the polarity of the situation that you're in. Unlike the first game, Langrisser 2 has 12 routes within it, and though a few suffer from the padding issue I mentioned earlier, I felt that the choices the player makes have far more weight here. 
I mean, look at this thing. You can't go here until you do this, but you can't do that until you do this. This one just loops on itself. I don't know what that's all about. So much to do. It helps as well that said routes diverge a lot earlier than Langrisser 1, as it gives time for these stories to take shape, and though they are still on the short side, I thoroughly enjoyed my time with them. And let me tell you, some of these routes are whack. Langrisser 1 had some interesting paths, but the final route I played in Langrisser 2 was gut-wrenching. I'll leave that for you to try out for yourself. In addition, I love the callbacks to previous titles, including the Elfleet trilogy, even though I've never played it before. It gives this sense of a grand world with rich history that's been woven over many years. Langrisser 2 giving these small references every now and then was a nice touch. Should any remastered sequels be on the horizon they follow this interconnected formula, I would feel very inclined to try them out. With all that said, I think it's time to wrap up. At the start of the video, we asked the question, are Langrissers 1 and 2 any good though? After playing around 50 hours over the course of both games, I will say Langrisser 1 is average and Langrisser 2 is great. You won't be getting deep stories or compelling characters, though one definitely does a better job than the other, but in exchange you'll get a myriad of shifting perspectives and simple yet enjoyable SRPG gameplay from start to finish. If you're looking for a tactical experience away from the more mainstream titles, I'd say you can't go wrong with the Langrisser series and there's no better time to start than now.